Universal Books, Transit Books, Seagull, Unnamed Press, and other stories in New Directions, Archipelago, Two Lines Press, Horn Fort Stars, Tilted Axis Press, Seven Stories Press, Pushkin Press, Other Press, New York Review of Books, Europe, Europa Edition, Steve Vellum, and many other university presses. And I'm sure I have missed many, many, many more publishers, these amazing folks that we're going to celebrate today. Welcome to another episode of Keybit Fictional with the Port Moody Public Library. I'm Virginia, and I'm here with my two book friends, Sadie and Emma. And I feel like next year I'm going to have to give this particular hosting duty up to somebody because I'm always hogging on this particular topic every single year um, because it's one of my favorite. Um, as you all know, we do a lot of celebrations on this show. Um, very often we celebrate specific types of books um, and today's is one of my favorite um, according to my spreadsheet and I can talk about spreadsheet here because Corinne is not here. Uh, according to my spreadsheet 79.05% of my books are all books in translation. Translations. So without these folks who do translation, without these publishers who publish um, all the books in translation, I would have nothing to read. Um, so I am always super, super thankful for all those people that make this available to us so that readers that read any other language can enjoy books from everywhere around the world. As you, as listeners know, we talk about books in translation all year long. This is, you know, not just the only episode that we mentioned them. This might be the show that you'll hear people, uh, names like Anton Herr or Megan Madawo as often as you hear the name of Kelly Armstrong on the show because, you know, we love these people so, so, so much. You know, like we all have our special translators. We all have our special, you know, like uh, publisher that we love um, that, that help us uh, get access to more books um, in from different languages. So today um, we are celebrating National Translation Month because this is September. It's September already. Um, and of course, in August, you know, we just celebrated Women in Translation Month. Um, so it's months and months of uh, books in translation that we are very, very excited to share with all of you. Um, so I think I'm going to pass it on uh, to... Um, Emma, I think Emma first, right? Emma, we're going to pass on to Emma so that Emma can share, um, you know, like their favorite, favorite uh, book in translation. Oh, I don't know if it's favorite, but the book that the the book that you read, I guess, may not be your favorite. I don't know. We'll find out. We will find out. What a great transition. Um, so this definitely was not my favorite book I've read in translation. Um, it wasn't bad per se, but I uh, I don't think I, I wouldn't say I read as many books in translation as Virginia does. But as our listeners know, I do specifically read a lot of Japanese literature. Um, so I do I do get a lot of translated works kind of in my regular reading. Um, I also really enjoyed the Bear Town series by Frederick Bachman, which is translated from Swedish. So in my reading history, I um, I'm drawn to translated works quite often. Um, I'm not like Corinne in that I have a favorite translator. I apologize. I haven't paid close enough attention to the names of the translators on the books that I've enjoyed, so I don't remember many of them. Um, but especially after like picking a book if, uh, and doing one for this episode, I think I want to pay more attention to the uh, to the translators that are putting in all this work to make these books accessible to us, because it really is so, so, so much work. Um, and something kind of funny that was noted at in my book that I read for today is uh, the author has kind of a throwaway line about how at one point in their life, they wanted to be a translator, but then they realized that translators are just severely underpaid and make absolutely no money. So even within this book that was translated that I'm reading for the pod today, they're showing their own appreciation for translation and the work that translators do, um, which is pretty cool. Pretty awesome to see that. Um, so the book that I have today was translated from Dutch, and this is actually my first foray into Dutch literature, so this was a new one for me. Um, this book I have was, was originally, it's marketed as a novel, but it kind of reads a bit like an autobiography. Um, I myself was getting a little confused throughout it. I was like, is this actually a novel? Is this actually fiction? 
Um, and I looked a bit online and other people were having the same experience where they were kind of getting more of an autobiographical feel from this book. But I, I think what it is technically is auto fiction. So it is a novel. There are fictionalized elements to it, but a lot of the story is taken from the author's own experience. Um, it's written in kind of a stream of consciousness style uh, that takes a lot of stories from the author's own life. So it's kind of difficult to tell what parts are true versus what parts are more fictionalized or dramatized. Um, and the writing style kind of reminded me a little bit of the uh, Kurt Vonnegut books that I really loved in my like late high school, early university days, where it's a fiction narrative, but the author inserts themselves into the book as a character and uses a lot of their own life experiences for plot. Um, the book breaks the fourth wall pretty often. It speaks to the reader often. And it has this very kind of honest and frank and like matter of fact writing voice where the author very much tells it like it is. There's no like sugary or flowery language. Um, so if you're looking for something with more elegant and beautiful prose, then this might not be the right book for you. But if you're looking for a book that's a page turner where not a lot of plot happens, or a millennial's autobiography kind of peppered with different philosophical insights, then you might enjoy this book that I have today. Um, so this book it was published in earlier 2024. It was published around February or March, and it's called The History of My Sexuality, can't see it super well, um, by Toby Lackmaker. So, and it was translated from Dutch by Kristen German. So like I said earlier, the book claims to be a novel, but it's a bit more of a disjointed autobiography uh, with some fiction elements here and there. Um, the protagonist and narrator is a character named Sophie who shares a last name with the author. So it's Sophie Lackmaker. Um, and Sophie shares both her surname and also some major autobiographical details with the author, Toby. Um, Toby Lackmaker is a transgender man, and he used the name Sophie prior to coming out. Um, typically, trans people don't often use their former names after coming out and changing their name, but Toby is quite frank and quite honest about the fact that he used to be called Sophie, so I feel like it's more appropriate to talk about it here, especially since the character uses the name as well. Um, so plot-wise, the book is separated into three separate parts. The first is more in chronological order. And it more or less goes through about half a dozen of different failed relationships that Sophie had with both men and women throughout her teens and her early adulthood. Um, she has a series of sexual encounters with boys as a teenager, most of which involved a lot of awkward fumbling. Um, and she dates a series of kind of, I would say, douchebag types, uh, boys and men who never really seem to truly see her for who she is, truly understand her which becomes more and more evident as she grows up and realizes that she's actually a lesbian. Um, so as a young adult, Sophie starts dating mostly women, including women from her football team. And because this is Dutch, when we say football, we actually mean soccer. Um, so people from her football team, uh, she dates an egotistical actress. She dates a really dramatic art director who at one point throws all of Sophie's furniture out onto the street and just like completely guts her entire apartment. Um, so these are kind of the series of failed relationships that he goes through, that she goes through, and pretty much all of these, uh, in, all of these romantic and sexual encounters end in failure, either because Sophie realizes that they're not healthy relationships and she gradually becomes more apathetic, she kind of uh, distances herself from these people, or in some cases, she was never truly committed to her partner at all, so that distance kind of grows on its own. Um, and as she's recounting these relationships in the book, bits and pieces are coming together about Sophie's gender identity. She's never really truly felt seen while she was dating men. She had long hair and she never really felt like herself when people would call her beautiful. They'd be like, you have beautiful long hair. You're this beautiful woman, this beautiful girl. And she always kind of had a complicated relationship with that. Um, when she shaved her head, she wasn't called beautiful anymore, but now instead of being called a beautiful woman, she is kind of being treated like she's a boy. She's often mistaken for being a 15-year-old boy, even as she's in her early 20s. Um, so she's in, always being told that she should grow her hair out, which any queer woman who's ever shaved their head relates to that, myself included. Um, so the second, so that's kind of how the beginning of the book goes. It's got these complicated stories of Sophie's different relationships that she's had. Um, she's kind of growing to understand her sexual identity and her gender identity better. And then the second part of the book goes back into the past um, and more into Sophie's university days 
And it tells what she describes uh, a more intellectual history of Sophie's coming of age with, I'd say, mixed success. Um, so she studied literature, and then she switched to studying philosophy. And then she ends up studying Russian with the hopes of becoming a translator. This is when she mentions that that plan was kind of turned when she realized that translators made very little money. Um, so in her studies, Sophie goes on a series of study abroad trips with her different departments. Um, and on these trips, it seems like the author was trying to send some sort of like insightful philosophical message, some like bigger picture, like this is what I learned on all of these backpacking trips across Europe. But this part ends up being more about other failed sexual relationships. So there's not a whole lot of insight to be found. Um, but what I found kind of interesting is the author is quite self-aware of this. Uh, something I appreciated is how the author is very frank about how confusing the structure of the book can be. And at one point, Sophie openly says in her narration, um, what I've been trying to do in part two is to offer some kind of intellectual history, but it's not working. Yeah, so she's pretty honest about like, this is kind of what I was attempting to do through this book, but that's not really what's happening anyway. Um, so like, it's confusing, but she she doesn't really kind of circle back and make and like say a bigger message after kind of going through all these different relationships. But then she's honest about that. So it's it's got this weird thing going on. Um, and then we get to the third part of the book which, according to Sophie, makes a giant leap into something I guess you could call the present. So this part um, was actually my favorite part of the book. This is the part I connected to the, the most. And this is where Sophie shares her experience with the death of her mother, something that was kind of like looming over her for the entire story. So throughout the book, she's mentioning different things about her mother, different like conversations that she's had with her. But we never properly meet her mother until at the end when we learn that her mother had cancer and that her mother passed away um, in Sophie's mid-20s. So this is the part that I enjoyed the most, actually. Sophie kind of abandons her desire to be witty and astute, and she just like allows herself to fully feel her grief. And she recounts pretty much exactly how she was feeling in the moment as she's kind of going through this experience of grief as she's learning that her mother is sick. Um, and how she, in this part, I found actually really relatable. Um, I thought it was a really realistic portrayal of grief. She talks about how she laughed at inappropriate moments when all she wanted to do, all she thought she should be doing was crying, but instead she was laughing. She talks about how her dad would cope by just continually making coffee for everyone and like not really engaging with what was going on over and over again. Um, and of all the parts of the book, this is the part that to me felt the most authentic and the most genuine. And it gave me a greater appreciation for Sophie and for what she was going through throughout the other parts of the story. Um, so that was a bit about the plot of the book. Uh, the writing style is kind of in this like familiar, familiar like millennial confessions, confessional style that I think is more popular these days. Um, it's filled with these like funny, sharp observations, but it doesn't really dive deep enough into any of them to make much of a lasting impact. Um, as Sophie's talking about her academic life, she's got this disdain for, um, for the books that she's been to told to read, for the people around her. It's a little bit like Holden Caulfieldy, where she's just talking about how everybody around her is a phony and she's like, like holier than thou kind of above these people so it can get a little bit annoying at times um the book is also loaded with these references to dutch media personalities and footballers and then there's observations on like the class relations between different neighborhoods in amsterdam which makes for great cultural criticism if you understand what the author is talking about but from a north american audience a lot of the references fall flat when they're taken out of their cultural context um, there was only one like reference to a famous Dutch person that I understood, and that was because she was talking about an actress who was in Game of Thrones. So I was like, yeah, this is the one person that I recognize, but pretty much all of these other people you're talking about are like musicians and footballers and like people that North Americans wouldn't really be familiar with. Um, so the book, it makes the book a little bit harder to get into if you're not if you're not understanding that cultural context. Um, and I typically enjoy books that are a bit more vague about where and when they take place. So it makes it easier to relate to the experiences of the characters. You don't have to know all of these reference points to really get into it. Um, so that's something that I that made it a little bit harder to get into. Um, the book feels very specifically Dutch, very much in Amsterdam. They make a lot of references to specific streets. So it could be a little more difficult for people outside of the Netherlands to really immerse themselves into it. Um, 
It's filled with a lot of really heavy themes. They talk a lot about loss and love and gender and sexual identity, but the author doesn't really go deep enough into any of these themes to really say anything about them, I would say. There's a lot of like funny anecdotes about these strange encounters that she's having, but she's not going deep enough in to like really get into what the what Sophie is feeling with all of these topics. Um, Sophie builds intimacy with the reader by addressing them directly. There's a lot of asides and kind of moments where they're talking in the second person, but it also maintains enough distance that you never really see Sophie get vulnerable. So it, it kind of has these different things going on. It was hard for me to fully immerse myself in the book because like it can be very witty. There's a lot of funny little quips there, but it's nothing that really sticks around long enough. None of these characters stuck around long enough or made me really truly care about them. So it was an interesting read because it was fun. Parts of it were definitely fun, but parts of it were harder to um, allow myself to really and fully invest in it, which is sad because I typically love books about like millennial queer identity, being a millennial queer person. Um, so I wouldn't say I hated this book, but it definitely was not my favorite book that I've ever read. It was just a little bit too, like it tried a little bit too hard at like trying to be funny, trying to be witty and insightful and philosophical and nothing truly felt like it landed. Um, I read a, a author interview with Toby Lackmaker with the author of the book and um, I learned that he is a magazine columnist in Amsterdam. So I think a lot of this like witty, quippy writing, a lot of the cultural criticism that he incorporates in his book would translate really well to column writing, to magazine writing, but I'm not sure if in the novel format, it really worked for me personally. Um, but if you're interested in confessional writing, if you like more autobiographical fiction, if you're okay with kind of problematic and unreliable narrators, um, or if you like stories that deal with topics like grief and mental illness with some more candid humor to them, then you might enjoy The History of My Sexuality by Toby Lackmaker, which was translated into English from Dutch by Kristen German. Thank you, Emma. I love that. Like, whether you like a book or not, you always provide a really, really good, not just analysis, but also you say, well, you know, if you like these, these, this stuff in this column, then you might enjoy the book. Because when you start talking like, about like, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say, because like, I didn't love it, but somebody else might like it. So I'm not going to say don't read it at all. I'm just going to say, if you like these things, then maybe you should check this one out. Yeah. I'm quite honest in my reviews. Yes, yes, you are. But that helps. That helps readers decide, right? Because when you start talking about things like, you know, like uh, a size, fourth war, and then like also like a confusing structure that really, I, I feel like that actually works really well because like, you know, many of us try to figure out our past and it's confusing. It doesn't make sense, right? So I, I like that they use that structure to kind of help you like see how confusing, you know, like their life might be and I really like that and and it's it's football it's not soccer I don't know what soccer is it's always football anyway um I want to ask you because I think this is a question that came up before but um you know when you mentioned that like this is a book that you feel like you know you really will kind of get to experience the culture um and maybe like you know a lot of like Amsterdam that like are references do you feel like this is a book that you would kind of suggest to people who like, you know how sometimes people like to read I think we talk about this before people like to read books before they go to a place um, do you feel like that would be like a good one just so that they can really get a sense of what like a city might feel like to somebody who lives there? Yeah, um, I, I've been to Amsterdam before. And so as I was reading the book, I, she was talk Sophie was talking about um, it's hard for me to do pronouns with this one because the author is a trans man, but the character is a woman. So I'm like, when I say she, I'm talking about Sophie and anyway. Um, but Sophie talks about like sitting along the canals with her various different sexual partners and like hanging out and going to these clubs. And I'm not a clubber, but it's obviously something that's really popular in like urban European lifestyle. Um, she talks about like when she, she does these backpacking trips across Europe, she was talking about like, oh, we were camping in the South of France and my friend was living in Aix-en-Provence and I've been to the South of France. So it's kind of fun to like visualize where Sophie is on these adventures that she's going on. And because she's saying like specific street names, specific neighborhoods all throughout Amsterdam, if you're reading the book with Google Maps open next to you, then you can like see exactly where all of these things are happening. You can find the cafes that she's working at and you can find the bars that she's going to. Um, so if you're interested in like learning about like millennial Amsterdam, then it could definitely be a really fun book. It's just if you are looking for something more to like 
something more relatable, something that's more like, oh, I can kind of see my own experience in this. Because of how specific the details are in this book, it might not be the right choice for that. But it is like extremely Dutch. Like she's name dropping Dutch Dutch celebrities and like a lot of Dutch footballers. There were a lot of people mentioned. <laughs> but if you're interested in um in learning more about like how like how Dutch people view Amsterdam and like there's some commentary on like the class relations between different neighborhoods, which neighbor like Sophie grew up in quite a privileged neighborhood. So they talk about like different stuff like that. So you can definitely learn quite a bit about Amsterdam through reading it. Um, but I also like, I can't remember every specific street name that she mentions. So, and she also does a lot of references to um, cycling everywhere, how she's always riding her bike all over the place, which is a very Amsterdam thing. So yeah, if you're interested in going to Amsterdam or learning more about it, then this could definitely be a good book to kind of guide you there. Could be cool. Also, it would probably be good for people who like, you know, like going down rabbit holes. Because I mean, part of it is sometimes when you're reading these books, you're like, what is that? Like, who is that? And then, you know, it gives you like a chance to just kind of look everything up, I guess. Yeah. CD, have you been to Am Am Amsterdam? No. Well, you can read this book and <laughs> seek if you want to go there. <laughs> I feel like it's on my list. It's, it's, I mean, there are so many countries on my list, but it's definitely it's one of them. Amsterdam is beautiful. Um, when I went, I rented a bike and just got lost biking on all the different streets with the canals. So like, it's the kind of city you don't have to have much of an agenda. You can just like rent a bike and go. And like, that's how I would recommend seeing Amsterdam, but also paying attention to the cycling rules because the Dutch people are crazy. <laughs> All right, some travel tips for our listeners. Um, so, <laughs> all right, I will share my book. Um, I was just saying to somebody the other day that I feel like I haven't, like, talk, like my books haven't had bugs in them for a while. And that's supposed to be, like, my theme. So I don't know what happened. I guess technically last week, uh, the, the Kenji Miyazaki's short story collection does have bugs, but they're more like kind of anthropomorphic like bugs like you know in fables and things so they i don't think they count but don't worry bugs are back after bringing you cockroaches and bed bugs and slugs i present to you today mosquitoes um so i discovered this book actually through a translator um and this actually has been a, a kind of a try and true way for me to get to know more authors that i haven't heard of before because i think mm -hmm. translators are super readers. They're like Emma described earlier. There's a lot of work, a lot of work involved in translating. And I think they are going to want to translate books that they also really love, that they want to bring to more readers so that more people can read them. And so I feel like when you're looking at like sort of a, a list of what the translator has done, very often you're kind of getting like, almost feel like you're getting personal recommendations from them. So I find that whenever I discover a translator that I really enjoy their work after I read a couple of them, like, you know, this, this seems like something that I will be kind of my type of books. I often like to look up what else they translate to see, um, you know, what other books that they would recommend kind of to me. So, and, and that has worked out quite well. So today, because there's too many books to choose from, so I kind of went this route. I, I pick a translator and I kind of explore their backlist a little bit. It's a translator that I um, have read for the first time this year. Um, his name is Kit Schulte. And um, he is, uh, actually, I, I got to know him from his book first. Um, he is also a writer and he published a short story collection this year called Cartoons. Um, and made me really appreciate, I think, micro fiction for the first time. I, I never really quite got them, but his was amazing. Um, and then a couple months ago, uh, for our most anticipated four reads, uh, I read the book called Thinking About Gladys Machine by Mario Lavero. And to my delight, realized that it is translated by the same person that I already read a collection. And after reading, like, uh, his book and also his translated work, I realize, like, I can see why he picked Mario Lavero um, because they both of the collections are super banana pants. They are like just really, really delightful stories, so absurd, so hilarious, and just so much fun. And so I love it. So I wanted to explore some other books by him. So there, I, I read two of them for today, um, but I'm going to talk about uh, only one um, and still bananas, but like if a very different kind of bananas. This is more like definitely more on the weird surreal and, and more serious kind of side but I think it's like both types of bananas are, are fun anyway um so the book uh, is called his name was Steph and it's by Raphael Burnell and as I mentioned translated by Kit Schulte um 
So our story feature an, a name narrator and this there's actually I think sometimes like when people decide to do a name narrator, I always kind of wonder why, <laughs> why, why not name them? Um, but I think this one actually has a reason. It, it's kind of a part of a key part of the story, why this remain an unnamed narrator. Um, but this is a middle-aged white man who has decided to turn his back on his fellow people. He's done with the so-called civilizations and he decided to move to the jungle in, Chiap in, in Chiapas, uh, Mexico. And he moved, we're not really quite sure why, but he feel like like the world has wronged him so badly um, that he's just like, he's so done with people. He's so done with the rest of it. He just wants to go away. Um, and as I mentioned, he just, we, we don't really know why, but you can feel how angry he is at the world. Um, he has been accused of being a drunk that's better off dead. And as he said, if I was a drunk, it was the world's fault. So he decided to move. And the only people that he kind of have contact with is one of the indigenous group that lives in the area, um, the Lacandon people. And at first they started off just more like just trading. He would go and hunt animals and then he would trade them for food. Um, but soon he lives among this particular group. And they kind of help him stop drinking. And every time they spotted any other traders or any other white people, they would just move further, further into the jungle. The Lacandon people call him the wise owl. And that's the name I'm going to use so that I can say the word owl a bunch of times today. So they, they think that he's kind of like uh, the wise owl. They think that he is one of the serpent god um, because they believe that he has some powers that he somehow can like talk to spirits. And YSIO didn't really bother to correct them. Whatever they like to believe about him, that's fine, you know, like. Um, and so soon, like slowly, he feels a little bit better, you know, about himself, about being here. Um, but there are definitely two things that kept, keeps him up at night. One of them is still his rage, his very intense resentment of people in general and the world that he came from. And the other Thing that keeps him up at night, the mosquitoes. There are so, so, so many mosquitoes. They're incessant buzzing, they're constant assaults, trying to suck his blood. And he basically just spent the whole night killing mosquitoes with his bare hands. And he would like put all that of them on his little table. And in the morning, there would just be like this big pile of dead mosquitoes. And that's first, that's kind of what he was doing. And he was very annoyed at these mosquitoes. But then he decided that, you know what, I'm going to like, I, I have all these like, like I have nothing to do, you know, I need to like find something to focus. He decided to study the mosquitoes, especially the sounds that the mosquitoes make. Because he believes that the mosquitoes are probably using the sounds to communicate with one another. So he wanted to learn, are there like different like vocal ranges? Are there different like patterns? He is trying to like listen really carefully to see if he could figure out like, is when they have this particular sequence of sound, does it mean something? And does it mean something, the same thing every single time? So he's trying to like kind of decipher there, is there like a language? And gradually he started to learn and he started to like figure out that there's certain sounds that always mean something, certain things. And so he decided to name this language the Mosquito language and he decided to like compile a dictionary of all the different sounds. Once he feel like he has got a pretty good command of their language, he wanted to see if he could communicate with them. So he decided to try to like produce those sounds, like just try to reproduce the sounds, just, you know, himself. But he figured that there's just certain sounds, certain like things that he just can't make. So he gets somebody to build him an instrument that could make those certain specific sounds. And when it was finally done, he decided to use the instrument to say the phrase, come, when there was one single mosquito that was kind of hovering about. And the minute the mosquito heard the sound, you could tell the mosquito is freaked out because there are no other mosquitoes around. Who is telling me to come? And so the mosquito just like laughed because it was so freaked out by this like sound that is coming from like nowhere. Never would have thought that it was a human making that sound. Um, and so 
the our our wise owl figured that I, I I can speak mosquito now. I know how to speak their language. What would you do if you could communicate with the mosquitoes? And we learned as the mosquitoes came back, and he tried and tried again to communicate and to talk to them. The mosquitoes, of course, are quite surprised because this is the first time in their many, 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 many years of life that someone was able to produce the sounds to communicate with them. But the mosquitoes kind of know this is going to happen somehow, and they've got a plan. They've got a plan for the humans, and they are going to ask Wise Owl to help them enact this plan. So this is the book. His name was Steph. It was published in 1947 and translated and published uh, by New Directions in 2021 in English. The author of this book, Rafael Bernal, is a Mexican novelist, um, best known for his crime novels, um, kind of a pulpy, noir kind of style crime novels. Um, I think the only one that has been translated into English so far is called The Mongolian Conspiracy, also published by New Directions, I believe. Uh, one of my favorite, favorite uh, publisher. And this one is quite different as, you know, it's, it's more of a science fiction. Um, still a bit pulpy um, because, you know, the sentient mosquitoes after all. But definitely the kind of science fiction that I would say maybe a little bit more, has also a little bit more of a literary band. Um, it's a very quick read, 150 pages only, but like many science fiction, it does dive a lot into some more kind of like philosophical, existential kind of um, questions. And again, like many other science fiction, whether it is the pulpy kind or whether it is the like literary kind, like there's always a lot of metaphors and allegories involved in here and everything kind of stands for something else. And there's, of course, like different groups involved here. Um, there's the indigenous people. That live in Mexico. There's the white people that came to try to exploit them, um, and and it's not the most comfortable read to start with sometimes because even though Wise Owl is still like that, they, they really do care for the people that he lives with. But you can tell that he has this upbringing and he can't help himself. He's thinking that like, oh, I'm gonna here, I'm here to save them. Like you know, he has that that like, kind of like the the upbringing just it, it comes through very frequently. So it's not like sometimes you. Just be prepared that you 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 get that a lot from him, and then of course there's the mosquitoes, um, and it's it's quite interesting what they did with the mosquitoes because the mosquitoes, as wise owls slowly learn, is actually highly organized. They are very very clear hierarchy in their society. Um, they very much value the collective in um, as opposed to the individual, and of course the mosquitoes see themselves as like a superior species. And that is, of course, a very science fiction kind of concept, right? Like, you know, you come across like a new society and you kind of like learn about how they work. And, and that is, you know, a way to explore kind of the different political ideologies in our world. Many people see his name was Steph, this book, as kind of a precursor to many of the eco fiction that is out there. Um, and I think having gone through the pandemic also, like you might you might see some parallels. You might be able to see some kind of like messaging um, that, you know, feels very ahead of time, given that this book was written in 1947. Um, it's definitely about like humans who think so much of themselves, you know, like, and also what happens when you give people a little bit too much power. I don't want to say too much about the book because I think, um, you know, it's just a really fun one to like discover what, it's going to happen. What is the mosquito plans and uh, how Wise Owl is going to like, you know, like react to it. Um, but promise you there's going to be rising. There's going to be bioweapons. There's going to be a lot of religious and philosophical debates. There's going to be talk about what is an ideal society. They even love triangles in this book. And of course, there are also mosquitoes. Um, so if that sounds great, if you also need some bugs book in your life, if you need some more translator work, um, if you, uh, you know, just are interested in a little bit of a science fiction, maybe a little bit apocalyptic, um, this might be a book to check out. It is His Name Was Death by Raphael Bernal, and it is translated by Kit Schroeter. All right. So before we move into uh, to Sadie's book, um, you know, we have it's time for our existential question. Not, I, I don't give this too existential today, um, but I would love uh, for my book friends to share. 
give, is there a book, whether it's like a, a, a novel, a nonfiction, a poetry, play, musical or whatever, or like, you know, a, a movie or a TV show that makes you want to learn a language? And did you actually go and learn a language? <laughs> I guess that's my follow-up question. <laughs> I can go first since mine's kind of an easy answer. Um, Virginia and I have both talked before about uh, wanting to learn Japanese so that we can read Japanese fiction in the original language. Um, I briefly took a Japanese course, just like the beginner Japanese one course at UBC, and I loved it. But because I didn't go too far into it, like I can't read hiragana. I can't read any any Japanese writing. I like learned how to say a couple of phrases here and there. Um, but I've always thought it would be really fun to learn Japanese so I can like understand what they say in anime. Um, and while I was in this course, I was watching this Japanese reality show on Netflix called Terrace House. It's just it's very wholesome. The whole premise is like people like uh, it's like six or three boys, three girls, six young adults like living in a house together and just like being housemates. So they like they go to work, they go to the grocery store, maybe they date each other, who knows, but it's very cute, it's very wholesome. Um, and in the show, they the, the language that they use, the phrases that they say often are like, do you have work today? How was your day? We should go to the grocery store. It's all very kind of like simple Japanese language. And so watching that show while being in the course was really helpful for remembering a lot of the things I was learning. So my easy answer is I would love to learn Japanese so I can like watch Japanese shows and read Japanese books, but it's not like I want to learn it to read one specific book or to watch one specific show like it because I love all different types of Japanese media, it would just be useful to be able to speak it. Um, but I also I took Spanish in school growing up and Virginia hearing you talk about your book kind of was making me think like, oh, it'd be really nice to like start working on my Spanish again so that because I took enough of Spanish that I would be able to read more simple Spanish fiction um, just after reviewing it a little bit more. But it was so long ago that I took it that a lot of it's probably lost now. So it would be nice to get back into learning Spanish again as well. Thank you, Emma. Um, yeah, like I think I'm very envious that you could read Spanish. Um, yeah, anyway, Sadie. Yeah, yeah, still like that's more than, and I also heard that like like that's really smart because I I heard that like it's good to um reality shows are actually a really good way to learn languages, especially if you're interested in the conversational part of it because they are they are talking about real stuff, right? Like where sometimes anime, like you know, I love anime, but like they, the stuff that they talk about, like it's not they're not worth talking it. about yeah, real like, stuff in every day, right? Yeah. But no, so if you're interested in Japanese, I would highly recommend Terrace House because like. I like bad reality TV, so I watch like Love is Blind and Love Island and stuff like that. And I don't think you would like that kind of stuff. But Terrace House is so just like cute and wholesome and wonderful that like I would recommend Terrace House to you, Virginia. And it's super, super helpful for learning Japanese phrases. So shout out to Netflix for that one. How about you, Sadie? Just on a side note, I too would like to pick up my Spanish again. So maybe you and me, Emma, we could like start talking about because it's it's been even longer for me it's been even longer for me but uh but I did I took it in I took it in school as well and I and I loved it so maybe one day um so my answer is a bit of a kind of cop out a little bit um mine is music but not like a specific song or specific musical but when I was regularly singing in choirs we would always sing Gaelic songs and I can sing in Gaelic but I have no idea what I'm saying no idea and if I was put in front of me I don't think I could actually pronounce the words outside of knowing the specific song so that would be one that I would love to learn Gaelic or Irish I think um depending on kind of what country I think in Ireland is just called Irish um, but I would kind of love to learn any any type of of Gaelic um, and partially because so then when I'm singing Gaelic songs that I can pretend to pronounce, then I can actually know what what I'm saying. <laughs> what about you, Virginia? Well, I think people like on the show has heard me said it a lot of times, like definitely Japanese. Um, I'm still attempting, attempting one day. Um, but I also have like resigned to the fact that I will never be able to speak it. So I should focus on reading because that's really why I want to learn it. So I'm just like, let's just focus on the reading. 
if I can say like you know how to go to the bathroom, that's okay as long as I know. Like right, like I just I feel like I should just focus. Um, but yeah, Spanish. That was when I like when I started reading a lot more Latin American literature in translation. I'm like I want to learn Spanish. So definitely, I I started like trying to you know pretend again pretend to to learn Spanish. Um, and of course, the reason the most recent one is after I read like Clarice Lispector. I'm like I need to learn Portuguese now. But like I stop myself because I'm very like I have very short attention span. So I'm like I, I know that like I, I can like you can't just keep jumping from one language to another. That doesn't make sense. So I have to stop myself. But like I think that would be the one right now at this moment. That would be the language that I, I want to learn to read the most because I really would love to know what um her like you know her her writing is like in the original language. And when I first read the first book uh, by her, the translator Itra Nove, I think also probably has the same experience. Like I feel like she said in her in her um introduction that she learned also so that she could read um Clarissa Spectrum. Like, what well, if she could do it? Maybe I could not just <laughs> it's never gonna happen. Um, anyway, so thank you, um, you know, like for, for that. And I hope that like, you know, we all have languages here. So, you know, like, you know, whatever inspiration that you have to go pick up a language, you know, it's, it's a great thing. Um, so yeah, we'll definitely be getting Emma and, and ask Emma and Sadie for lessons, for Spanish lessons now. We need a library program, please. Like, can we request a library program? Spanish I think I still have all of my high school Spanish notes somewhere. So maybe mine might be one. at my parents' house. Mm -hmm. And I, I am a trained teacher, but not a trained Spanish teacher. So I don't think my Spanish is good enough to be an instructor yet. But I'll keep you posted, Virginia. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. All right. Um, so uh, we're going to go to Sadie for her recommendation today. All right. So I for whatever reason, do not actually tend to read a lot of translated works. And I, I wish that I read more and that that could, I think might be a, a goal for me in uh, the upcoming year is to kind of look into more translated works um, so that I, I kind of have more to pull from uh, when this episode comes up. Um, Cause I always, I, I enjoy the stuff that I read for uh, around this time of year, um, but I don't read a lot of it throughout the year. So that is, that is something that I am going to work on because uh, I would love to to kind of see what else is out there and just hearing um, Virginia, you always talking about translated works and uh, Emma hearing you talk about uh, the stuff that you, you've read for this week. Um, it just, it makes me want to want to explore it more. So that is something I will do. Uh, but the book that I did pick for today was actually one that came onto my radar last year uh, when we did do our uh, books in translation episode, uh, but I was not able to get my hands on it last year. Um, so this year I thought I would try it again. Uh, and so I was able to pick up a copy of it. Uh, and this is a big book. Um, the Enigma of Room 622 by, I looked at the pronunciation, Joelle Dicker. Um, and Joelle is a Swiss author. Um, he writes in French. And uh, this book was translated from the French by Robert Bonono, um, who has been translating works for over 30 years. Um, and this story is kind of a story within a story, within a story. And as most books, it begins with a writer. Now, our writer lives in Geneva, Switzerland. He's well known and has sold millions of copies of his books, mostly due to his amazing publisher, Bernard de Folois. However, Bernard has just died and our writer is feeling a little bit lost. Now, this is all in fact true about the character in the book, it is also true about our author, Joelle Decker. And while the writer in the book is never actually named, it is clear that our author has placed himself as a character in the story. The writer has decided to honor his publisher, mentor, and friend by writing a book about him. And this too is true about our author. It is during this process that he meets Sloane, beautiful, passionate, living right next door to him. They begin an impromptu love affair, immediately drawn to one another. However, the passion quickly starts to wane as the writer realizes that he has been forsaking his writing and by association forsaking the memory of his dear publisher. And so he turns his focus back to his book. Soon, Sloane sees that the writer will always be putting his work first, and so she leaves him. 
heartbroken and distraught. The writer takes himself on a retreat to the small village of Verbier in the Swiss Alps and checks into the Hotel de Verbier to mourn both of his recent losses. Upon arriving, he is led to room 623. Seems pretty normal. As the porter brings him down the hall, he notices that room 622 seems to be missing. In its place, instead, is 621A. Curious about this strange anomaly, the writer inquires with another hotel guest, Scarlet, who is actually staying in the mystery room. This spurs Scarlet on to begin an investigation to discover why the hotel has, en- has erased an entire hotel room and why the staff of the hotel refused to talk about it. The answer is simple. Murder. Years ago, on a cold evening in December, a corpse was found in room 622. The murderer was never discovered, the crime was never solved, and the hotel decided it was better to pretend that room 622 never existed. Scarlet is not, however, willing to accept this. Intrigued, after recognizing who the writer is, she decides that this story must be told, and the writer must tell it, and she will help. So the two start their investigation into the murder of room 622. As they investigate, they slowly learn that everything that happened on that December night is linked to one of Switzerland's largest banks. Now the bank holds an employee gala at the hotel every December. And the December before the murder, the gala had already made quite a stir. It was set to be when the new president of the bank was announced, following the death of Abel Ebesner the year before. Abel's son, Macaire, knew it would be him, as had been tradition since the bank first opened in the 1700s. However, Macaire and everyone at the gala is shocked when Abel's will announces that he has gone against tradition and puts the decision to a vote by the now three-person board of directors. The decision will be announced at the following year's gala dinner. Macaire is furious, embarrassed, ashamed at his father's decision. However, he knows that his father hasn't looked at him the same in over 15 years. Ever since Macaire, for seemingly no reason at all, transferred all of his bank shares to Signor Tarnagol, a shady man who nobody really knows anything about and is now one of the board of directors. However, there's more to Macaire's decision than anyone realizes, and more to Macaire himself. For the last 12 years, he's been living a double life, one where he is both a mild-mannered wealth manager who is really not that good at his job, and also a secret agent for the Swiss government. The P-30, a section of the Department of Defense, For years, he has been using his knowledge of finances and his client list from the bank to track down traders and embezzlers for the government. He still believes that he will be named president, and in doing so, he knows that he will need to step down from P30. However, as the gala and the announcement draw near, Macaire starts to realize that his chances of being named president are actually much lower than he thought and he is forced to look at all possibilities to get the job that he believes he is owed. When his P30 contact approaches him with a solution to his problems, he thinks he's finally going to get what he wants. That is, as long as he is okay with just some mild government-issued murder. As McCare starts to work out that he's been backed into a corner that he can't easily escape from, he needs to decide if getting the job he's always expected is worth what he is being asked to give up. This book jumps around quite a bit in both time and kind of format. Um, It goes from the writer uh, in the present day, which is 2018, um, and Scarlet as they kind of dig deeper into their investigation. It goes back to Macaire in a time that we are not told of. Um, They don't really say when this earlier time is. You don't know when the murder actually took place. They give um, hints as you go along. You know that it's uh, recent enough for there to be cell phones, but that's kind of it. Um, They don't really tell you much more than that. Uh, So it jumps back to that um, in the weeks before the gala as McCare tries to kind of navigate this dangerous political game that he didn't even really realize that he was playing. 
It also goes to flashbacks to 15 and 16 years before the murder, providing background information on McCare, on his wife, Anastasia, and his business rival, Lev, uh, and giving the reader kind of more information about all of these events, which do inevitably lead to the murder in room 622. Uh, many of the scenes of McCare and Lev and Anastasia are written almost as if they are actually the writer's first draft of this book that he is attempting to write based on his investigations, um, which makes things read a bit strangely as you're not entirely sure if what you have just read is actually what happened or is something that the writer has created in, in his story. Um, you know that he has information that you don't that he's done for his investigation, so you can kind of imagine that that's what he's using to write this, but you're not entirely sure what what is being fictionalized for for his book. Um, it, uh, gosh, I lost my train of thought. Um, um, also the fact that the writer is kind of for all intents and purposes, the author of the book, it kind of adds that even more kind of convoluted layer to how the story is told, um, to make it even stranger. You don't know who's been killed, uh, and you don't find out for quite a while. So full disclosure, I'm not done this book. Um, I'm just over halfway through and I still have no idea who has actually been killed. You know that someone has the book. The very first uh, page of the book tells you that there's been a murder in room 622, but that is kind of all that you know. So it, it kind of adds that other layer to to the reading experience um, where you have no idea who it it actually is. Even um, when Scarlett and the writer are kind of doing their investigation, they know, <laughs> you know that they know who it is, um, but you they don't tell you, which is kind of an interesting reading experience, kind of knowing that the characters know more than than the reader does in there, so kind of specifically not, not saying anything. Um, I would say that even though I am not finished this book, I am really enjoying it. Uh, I, I find that it's not the kind of book that you can read quickly. I think that it's the kind of book that kind of invites you to more kind of take your time and explore the, the characters and explore the story, explore kind of the scene of it. Um, and even though it kind of has more kind of high stakes elements to it, it doesn't necessarily, I wouldn't say like it reads like a spy novel. It doesn't read like a murder mystery. Um, it reads more kind of with a focus on the characters and kind of learning, learning about their backgrounds, learning about their history and their relationships. And kind of through that, you're able to piece together kind of all of these different parts that are, that are going to come and, and eventually reveal what, what actually happened and what events from 20 years earlier have led to to this actually um actually happening. I think that the way that um Joel Dicker uh, like writes the story, he's able to add enough intriguing elements to it um that he's able to balance out kind of the potentially less interesting aspects of it. Um a book about banking might not seem that that exciting. Um and I think that at times it it is potentially not. Um, but I think that he is able to kind of balance that out with the fact that our main banker is a secret agent for the government. And, and you kind of get all these kind of side stories and side, um, side characters that kind of add, add to the interest of the book and, and kind of make it, make it more exciting, uh, to read. Um, I think that the way he writes it, he never fully gives up important pieces of information. He kind of alludes to things without actually telling you outright, um, that something has happened. Um, so you know that there's a ton of characters who are trying to hide things or who are hiding things, but you have no idea how, what they're hiding plays into any of the other aspects of it. You don't know kind of who is working with who or for who and kind of how it all ties together, which I think does make it kind of more, more fun to read because you're, you're, you're a little bit confused, but, uh, but you're along for the ride and, and it's, and it's fun to, to kind of figure it out. Um, yeah, I just think that it, it it's meant to be savored a little bit more. Um, he does definitely pay. Um, Digger Digger did write the book as an homage to his publisher, and that is that aspect of the story is not fictionalized. Um, his publisher was Bernard de Folloy or Foy Bios. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and he did pass away in 2018, and. He, the author did want to kind of write this story um, for him. And so he definitely includes that as an actual 
uh, non-fictionalized aspect of it. Um, the characters in the book, they don't interact with the publisher. The character of the publisher himself doesn't actually come up a lot, but um, in kind of the writer telling his history to Scarlett and the writer kind of explaining what his relationship with his publisher was, um, it kind of is able to give voice to the stories and the history of this man who who our author very clearly admired and and wanted to kind of have as this book as uh, to remember him by. Um, so yeah, I think that if you do enjoy a mystery that has a bit more focus on characters, um, less on the actual crime itself, um, or if you enjoy kind of being held in suspense, trying to figure out what exactly happened, who exactly was killed, um, and uh, what's kind of going on with all these uh, kind of multiple pieces um, working together, including secret government agents, under the table deals to save people's lives, dramatic love affairs, double lives, which lead to, lead to murder, like all of this stuff just kind of goes together and creates a fun, um, engaging story. So if that sounds like something you would like, uh, then I would definitely check out this is the room. The Enigma of Room 622 by Joël Ducaire, translated from the French by Robert Bonono. And a weird side fact, this is the second book that I have read in the last week that does not reveal who the victim of a crime was until the very end. <laughs> Interesting way of writing the book. Thank you, Sadie. And also interesting when you said like, oh, yeah, the characters know more than the readers. Very often it's the, the opposite, right? So it's like, it must be very weird. And and like you said, it, it's hard to probably have to write that way and make sure that, you know, that doesn't get, you know, like leak out somewhere. And I can see that it, it really does take a lot of skills to be able to like have like so many layers and so many convolution, like kind of a little stuff, but like also still keep you engaged, as you said, like you're still really interested to know what's going on, even that there's so many unknowns. I find sometimes when like, you know, I, I don't know, I'm going to say Netflix because, you know, Emma already gave Netflix a shout out. Sometimes Netflix shows, I find like they're very annoying because it's like, like they just keep not telling you things. And I'm like, well, like you have to give me something to care about you because or else I don't, I'm, I'm not interested. You you can just say, oh, well, I'm going to tell you later or whatever. Like, but it's like, just give me something, give me something. But it sounds like this one, the author manages to, throughout the whole book, give you enough things to keep you guessing. Yeah. That was that was my issue with the show Lost for so long because you would end the episode so much more confused than when you started the episode. It's like, okay, so you've answered this, but then you've introduced five more things that you're not going to tell us anything about, and now I have no idea what's going on. So Sadie, since you said that you haven't finished it quite yet, you're assuming they're going to tell you who got killed at the end, are you? <laughs> because maybe well, it it's. It's interesting because one of the reviews I was reading oh. say that the ending is like quite unbelievable. Okay. And so like it, it kind of like goes like way off into left field in like a very, very unbelievable, fantastical way. So I'm I'm intrigued exactly what that means. Um but I do think one of the, I didn't read who gets killed, but it does one of the, another review I was reading did say like it does it takes a while, but it does tell you. So, yeah. Because I love to read it, but when they don't tell you, maybe after 607 pages, <laughs> 700 pages later, nope, not going to say anything. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, thank you so much, Emma, Sadie, bringing different types of books. We have some auto fiction, we have mystery, and then we have, I don't know, science fiction, whatever this is. Um. But thank you so much for for bringing all different types, you know, and um, and Sadie, you mentioned earlier, it's, it's hard to find. And like, I think the stat that always get thrown out, and I think this is quite out of date, but like they always say it's like 3%, 3% of all books that are published in North America is a work of translation. So they are hard to find. They are very hard to find. Um, so, you know, like I hope that, you know, um, the people that are making this, changing this, um, are getting more support, getting more, um, you know, like funding and everything so that they can actually make more of this available to us. And I just want to leave with um, the last thing, which is uh, September 30th. It's the International Translation Day. And their theme this year is uh, Protect Translation as an Art. And I think that's a really appropriate theme, especially given that sometimes people think that robots can do a lot of things. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge 
how much work that a translation requires. It's not just about substituting a word with another word. It's really about having reading the book, digesting it, and trying to, you know, communicate that same writing style, same tone, you know, like atmosphere, so much of the original work. Try to communicate in a different language. Um, as many people say, they're actually creating. You're like actually writing a new book in many sense. So it is definitely an art. It is not something that even if we can master Spanish, it's not something that any of us could do probably. Um, so, you know, again, thank you so much for all the translators and all the publishers out there that specialize in translation. Um, you are bringing so much, so much joy to us and to readers all around the world. So thank you for all the work that you do. Um, and I am sure you will hear about books in translation all throughout the year from us. So um, look forward forward to more books, um, you know, in, in all different formats and all different ways. So thank you again for tuning into another episode of Keep It Fictional and we will see you next week. Happy reading. Mm -hmm.